Welcome, my friends. Uh, it's great to worship with you like this, to know that our God is so powerful and that we got to sing and we get to sing to his name all the time. My name is Cameron Baker, one of the pastors here at Grace Church, and I just want to welcome you. Uh, as we begin tonight, we actually start a brand new series together on these first Wednesdays. It's entitled Survivor, uh, and we're going to be exploring really what it takes to survive and thrive as a believer in this world that we walk through day by day. I don't know if you uh, caught the news this past week, but there were some significant things that happened. You, you're watching them unfold before your eyes. There were Supreme Court rulings, uh, health concerns continue to top the news, persecution over our faith in many areas of life, are becoming more pronounced. Uh, we, we are witnessing rumors of wars, riots, and unrest, and you get to the place where I think you could join with me and just say, Jesus, make the devil and his influence stop in this world. Our prayer could be that simple over and over again each day. Um, it seems at times overwhelming. And the hostility against believers and against godliness in general shouldn't come as any surprise to us. It was Jesus who said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Now, in some ways, those aren't necessarily encouraging words, but at the same time, we know as believers that we walk firmly in the footsteps of Jesus. And the road that he walked was a difficult one. And so let me state the obvious that this world is a hostile place for a Christian man or a Christian woman. Very little in our society points us to godliness or Christ-likeness. And the culture that we live in continues to assault Jesus, the foundation of the one and only that we know to be true. But when we have these things coming at us and coming against us and seemingly surrounding us, what do you do? In what ways are you prepared for this type of onslaught? I propose, I propose to you tonight that you need to be trained as a survivor and as a victor. And tonight, again, like I said, we begin a new series exploring what it takes to survive and thrive as a Christian in a hostile world. Now, in this series, you will experience some, I'd like to think, advanced training and, and discipline yourself for the fight that's sure to come because you never know what's going to happen next. I'd like you to remember this as we progress through today, that spiritual training prepares you to survive an earthly life and to be ready you have two main needs right now. Then that need, number one, is a training program, and number two is a willingness to train, to enter into that process. So if you're following along with us, I invite you to turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, it's a letter where the Apostle Paul is training his young protege, Timothy, for what's to come, for Timothy's life as a believer in a hostile world. Now, let me just take us off to the side for a moment, and really, we, when we come into that idea of training, I want to ask you, what event have you spent the most time in your life ever training for? For me, three events really come to mind fairly quickly. The first is my desire as a young man to drive a car as soon and as legally as possible. The second was earlier in a career, uh, I needed to pass a securities dealer's exam. My job depended on passing that exam. And then third, when finally, when I said yes to life and ministry, uh, I needed to complete a biblical seminary education. A and the reason for each of those three moments in time, those events, they come to my mind because I had to study, I had to practice, and I had to train. You see, it seems like the really important things in life, they don't necessarily come naturally. 
We need some training and some experience in them. And each of those events represented a goal, a desire before me that I didn't have any experience with before that training took place. And so in this life, as a follower of Christ, we're in a very familiar, a very similar situation. We enter into this world as an infant, a sinner from the very start. As believers, we know that Jesus has saved us, has set us free. And then after that, it seems like we need to unlearn all of the life experience that we have in sin and the way that we were living our lives and begin a new training program. And so Paul to Timothy, if, if you look with me in 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, uh, this is what Paul writes to Timothy. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and such things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the Word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. I'd like to zero in on verse 7, where we find Paul instructing Timothy, train yourself to be godly. I don't know if you've ever wondered what that means. It's a fairly simple and straightforward statement, but I want you to know that Paul is actually using a, a very vivid word picture here, very, drift, very different than what your English translations present for themselves. When Paul writes, train yourselves, the word picture uh, that he's using there comes right out of the Greek athletic world, where contestants would practice and compete naked. Now, I want you to get away from and all over the mental picture that's just entered into your head. Because the idea that Paul is presenting here is that they're competing with no advantage whatsoever. They're, they're no, they don't have any special clothing on. There's no special equipment when they compete. They compete with their training alone. And again, as a believer in Christ, you've been born into a new life, stripped of your sin by Jesus, and appearing clean before the Father. And now it's time to train for something better, to train to be like Jesus, stripped of everything of the past, and train to imitate Jesus. Spiritual training prepares you to survive an earthly life and to be ready. Your first need is a training program, specifically a training program with Jesus and your relationship with Him as the focus. Personal training is why I encourage you to read the Bible every day and to spend time in conversation with God, to regularly meditate on Him. I mean, after all, as we all long to get back to our favorite restaurant, you don't want to show up at a restaurant and have someone have to spoon feed you. You've already learned to feed yourself. And part of our training as believers is to learn how to feed ourselves through the Word of God and how to, in ourselves and through the Holy Spirit, stay in relationship with the Father regardless of what's going on around us. Your own personal training is one of the reasons you have the Holy Spirit to guide you and to teach you. 
And I want you to pic picture this. Picture the Holy Spirit as your personal trainer, as He's there whispering in your ear to press on and to press forward or to draw closer to the Father or to head out and minister to that person. The Holy Spirit is there as your personal trainer. It's not just something to picture because He really is your personal trainer. And I want you to look again and see what Paul says, the value, the, the benefit of this spiritual exercise. In verse 8, he says, Godliness has value for all things, holding promise both for the present life and the life to come. The training and the promises of God are not just to get you ready for the future, but to have you prepared for today. And this message series is just that training program. We're going to be talking about and unpacking over the few, next few months the whole idea of spiritual disciplines, the, the real backbone of our training together. And you may ask, what is a spiritual discipline? And I would define it this way, that in, in the broadest sense speaking, it's any activity designed to change your character, your spirit, your skill set, or your behavior to be more like Jesus, to be more Christ-like. Spiritual disciplines are activities that are designed to create a new pattern in your life. Patterns that very quickly bring you into God's presence, maybe faster than has happened before in your life, and allows you to live in godliness more freely. It becomes much more automatic. Imitating Christ becomes the muscle memory of everything that you are. It provides potentially a path back to the Father if you stray, and with the Holy Spirit prepares you and again sustains you for each day. So, one of the goals for the series is to be ready, to be strong, and to be faithful to the one who we know is true. And I don't want to imply in any way that this is doing this on your own, but this is a partnership that you enter into with the Holy Spirit that as a believer already dwells within you. So if we need a training program with Jesus as a focus, what are some of those disciplines that we're going to explore? And I'm going to go through just a couple of them quickly. The first is prayer. Learning to spend time talking in an easy, casual conversation with God the Father. Sometimes in hard places, sometimes in easy places, but that He's the first one you want to speak to, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane or the prophet Daniel in captivity in Babylon as he's commanded not to pray, and he continues to go forth. The second thing we're going to talk about is meditation. Learning to invest time dwelling richly on God, who He is, His character, His Word, all of those character traits that as we learn them, we look more and more like Jesus. We look more and more like our Father in heaven. We think about, we're going to talk about fasting, uh, deeply embracing Jesus' words that a person does not live by food alone, but from every word that comes from the Father. It's one of those reasons why prayer and fasting are so often combined. And we're going to talk about singing, praising God, and at the same time with your mouth, but also with your spirit. And think about this, how, how easy, songs just seem to naturally stick in your mind. And that wasn't the discovery of some advertising executive somewhere. It's how you were designed by the Father to worship in song, to pour out your heart. And that's just a few of the things, a few pieces of that training program that we're going to explore together. But the training program, if that's our spiritual survival training, the second need that you have there is a willingness to train. It's a proven fact, and change happens the most quick when you desire it and engage in the change process itself. Now, let me tell you, this is a, a, I think this is a funny story. Hopefully, you'll join with me. That a, As a boy, uh, I thought I wanted to play soccer. Um, it looked fun, you know, well, kicking the ball around and shooting goals and defending the goal, but uh, 
Then I found out once I signed up that there was practice, a lot of practice. And I found out that, that the games that they played on Sunday, and, and they played them just in the hot sun. And then I also found out they played in the rain. And, and at practice, I had to run back and forth, back and forth, up and down the field, and occasionally around the whole field. <clears throat> And that training and that practice was not very appealing to a young boy shaped kind of like a bowling ball with legs. To say that I was uncommitted to the process, that I was disinterested and unengaged, or, or rather not engaged, was kind of a nice way to describe what was going through my mind every time I put that uniform on and dragged up those giant socks I was more like, just get me out of here and off the field. You see, I like the idea of playing, but not enough to commit to the process. Personal commitment makes or breaks your discipline of training in anything that you do, and in turn, any progress that you might make. And so, have you maybe just begun your journey as a Christian? This training program is for you. M maybe just now, he hearing these words and these ideas, maybe just today you've recommitted to your own personal growth in Jesus Christ. Maybe you feel like you've stalled out a little bit. Or maybe you're in a place where you're ready to help somebody else along the way. You've already put your hope and your trust in Jesus, the salvation that he brought for you at the cross. You know that he saved you for all eternity. You know you're there. Heaven is there before you, waiting for you. But are you equally as committed in your mind and your heart to actually being and training to be a follower of Jesus? to have everything in your life imitate His life, His love for the Father, His love for other people. Today is the day to decide to enter into that process. If you're already a follower of Jesus, I hope that that also means that you are committed to being a disciple. And a disciple, very literally, is simply a learner or a follower. You choose to learn from someone else. Regardless of what you know or what you thought, you're stepping in and under someone else's teaching. And you willingly leave your old life behind. That's what Jesus is, enter, uh, is inviting us into, to enter into his life and his world. The fact is, you want to be an imitator of Jesus. And when you make that decision, your life and the direction of it has a completely new goal. And the goal in being a disciple was what Jesus himself stated in Luke chapter 6, to be like the teacher. To be Christ's disciple then is to practice to be like him. Not for show, not for any type of reward or comment, but because it's an internal decision or, or a promise that you've made to yourself to join Him. Fortunately, uh, even if you struggle with that type of willingness, the good news is that you can ask the Father for help. Something as simple as, and when Jesus calls him Father, we want to be very familiar with him. So we're, I'm going to even call him Dad in this moment. But, but if you're struggling with that commitment, you can even say something as simple as, Dad, show me how to act like your child. Give me the internal drive and the desire that I need to train and to change. And in that, I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit is there with me to actually effect that change. Remember what Paul said about this godliness, that for physical training, 
is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. When you start this journey, you will start to see rewards in everything you do. They are not necessarily going to be evident to others, but you'll know that you're that much closer to the Father and where you want to be. As we end our time here in the Word together, spiritual training, again, prepares you to survive an earthly life. He gives you a training program. He, the Father, grants you willingness to train. And I want you to embrace the idea that, that you are going to train and enter into this without restraint, that you won't allow anything to get in your path as we experience these different spiritual disciplines together. Tonight, uh, one of the things that we are going to do together is to celebrate the Lord's table together. And so, if you've not done so already, I invite you to go gather those elements and, and be prepared to share them together. Uh, but first, we are going to worship in another song together. to this table together tonight. All by itself, it represents a spiritual discipline because it's Jesus himself who commanded us to come to this table and to do this in remembrance of him. The song we were singing tells the story and makes it a little more personal, that this is not just a moment looking back in history. Jesus and his disciples and in the upper room and just before his crucifixion. 
But the song reminds us that there was a debt to be paid. Your debt and mine, that debt of sin. And the only way that that sin and that debt can be wiped out and paid in God's economy, he told us there was only one punishment and that would be death. And so Jesus willingly allowed his body to be broken. So Jesus told his disciples that the bread that they were about to eat was to represent his body. And so he broke it, passed it around, and told them to eat. Now is the time as you hold that bread in your own hand. If you've not done so already, to confess that Jesus died for your personal sins and to proclaim that he's your savior and that your debt has been paid. For those that as the word says, recognize the body. The fact that this bread represents Jesus' body. Let's eat together, remembering his deep love for you. Let's eat together. And as the song reminds us, Jesus allowed his blood to be spilled on the cross. Again, to pay your debt and mine. And Jesus, after supper with his disciples, he, he took the cup and he proclaimed this cup to be the new covenant in his blood, the new promises of God, not just for his disciples, but for everyone who calls in the name of Jesus to be saved. It's just some juice in this cup. But this commandment, this discipline, this remembrance helps us remember the very real sacrifice that Jesus made for you and I. And so with that in mind, let us drink together. Lord Jesus, you have been present here in our worship and will continue to be. But we want to thank you together for allowing yourself to be sacrificed for us, but also to show your power over death and the grave by your resurrection. And so as we enter into a relationship with you through faith, may we always remember that we enter in also with that resurrection power and the promise of life to come and your Holy Spirit to be with us now and always. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to continue to worship together. I will not boast in
It has been a joy to worship with you, to, for all of us to be here and to come into your lives like this. We're thankful for the opportunity. And as we enter into this spiritual training program together, I pray that the Holy Spirit meets you right where you are and just draws you a little closer. I'd like to end today with a blessing that God Himself pronounced over His people. In His name, as He revealed it to His people, Yahweh. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make His face to shine on you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Until we see you again.